<laughs> Are we live? <laughs> yeah, record that. We might have to negotiate with this guy later. <laughs> we might have to bring in some red, uh, some San Francisco garbage snakes to get rid of them. Was that what he eats them? Yeah. Don't right. touch those either. No. Are they in the really plan? Have you seen any over there in your place? Yeah. yeah. Some San Francisco garbage snakes. Oh, we won't. Okay, all right, it's seven. We on good. Yeah, seven o'clock. So, fencing. I'll call the meeting uh, of April eighth. Uh, Coastside County Water District to order. And would you lead us in the? Oh, sorry. Can you do that first? Yeah. All right. I'll do the flag later. It can wait. Uh, here. Vice President Michelson. Here. Director Flint is absent. Director Glassford. Yeah. President Reynolds. Here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Go Huskies. Go Huskies. All right. Uh, do we have any public comment speakers? Comments? Cards? Okay. All right. Uh, moving on, uh, do we have anything uh, that anyone would like uh, to have reserved from the consent calendar? I'd like to pull the uh, water production from oh, all you sources. Need to do it. Oh, sorry. Oops. I don't want to do it. <laughs> well, that makes two of us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Since Joe's here to flog. <clears throat> we haven't seen him in a while. Okay. okay. Miss one meeting. Miss uh, one meeting. Sheesh. <laughs> Tough crap. So, so number F, letter F, the total coastside production report, please. Okay. And did you have any any items you'd like pulled from the consent calendar? No. Okay. Uh, that being said, uh, I'd like uh, a motion, if possible, to, for the consent calendar passage. Uh, move to approve the consent calendar, excluding item F. Okay. Um, second, and do we want to hear from Arnie about the A or just? It was fine. Okay. I would have spoken up. <coughs> oh, right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Do we need a roll call? Yes. Yep, okay. All right. Uh, Vice President Michelson? Yes. Director Flint is absent. Director Glassford? Aye. And, and I. All right. Um, do we have, uh, do you want to, uh, well, we'll do the production report at the end. Or, is that appropriate? Joe, do you want to do it now or? The when, production, when, well, I'm not sure what the questions are. Oh, so we were we pulled um, <laughs> the con, from the consent calendar the total Coastside County production report. Right. And the leader take the so would you like to do that towards oh, the end oh, of the oh. meeting, or would you like to do it now? Well, the, we're talking about item F. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't normally give a report on that. Well, um, you're going to. Okay. And you're going to Do you want a few minutes to, raise, to prepare yourself? No, and, I, I'm curious. I'm very curious. Okay. So I, I pulled it, and uh, so I'll start. It, just in reviewing the report, the concern that I had was uh, in our production, almost everything we're getting is from Crystal Springs. Yes. And I understand why. I mean, I, I know that we're in a very difficult water year and difficult situation. But the concern that I have is that uh, I want to know if we're trending up at Deniston Reservoir in terms of water production. If you see that trending up, or because in looking also at the budget and uh, you know the cost of operating and doing business right now, and the prediction of, of how the budget's going to go in the future, looks to me like we're going to buy a lot of San Francisco water, which is very expensive. And I want to be sure that we're doing everything in our power to avoid that. But when I look at the production across all the various sources, um, I just don't see very much. So I'm like. Kind of nervous. Understood. And uh, the answer is yes on both <coughs> accounts. Uh, Deniston uh, Reservoir, we are, we, Deniston is running as we speak. We have plans on keeping it running as much as we possibly can. Uh, as far, uh, but <coughs> what's very concerning to me also is the Crystal Springs Reservoir. Yes, we've been on it for over a year now. And of course, this, this relates back to the failure of the uh, Stone Dam pipeline and our, uh, uh, our attempts to, to get the temporary pipe up to speed. Uh, we had a problem with elevations uh, on that pipeline. Would, would we put the temporary pipe in? The old pipe 
As soon as it came out of the, what they call the aqueduct up there in SF, San Francisco, it dropped immediately. It just dropped uh, at a, quite a steep angle through the jungle to the bottom of the, of the canyon uh, uh, to, the, to our, our, uh, our, our, our lands over there by our well field. Uh, the new pipe has to, had to go up a little bit. And so there was an air entra entrainment issue because they could never keep their aqueduct completely full. All right, so there was always, it would waver, it would go up and down, when it would go down, air would get into that pipe, and of course we had an airlock. All right, so we were only able to get uh, not even a thousand gallons per minute, uh, with, uh, more like 800. The original pipeline uh, gave us 1600 gallons per minute before we had to switch to Crystal Springs. So uh, we have been in, di we've had dialogue with SFPUC and they have made repairs on their valve. They had an ancient valve that, that was very difficult to operate, that it was a balancing act between keeping the, 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 their aqueduct high and then, or, or losing that water to uh, uh, Upper San Leandro, Lower San Leandro Reservoir, uh, uh, San Leandro, uh, the uh, Crystal Springs Reservoir. They've made, re they've made some extensive repairs on that valve. They think it works. Uh, but then once it was all repaired and we were ready to, to try it out, there's no water in Pelicitos due to the ongoing drought. Uh, but the recent rains of uh, March and February has raised the elevation in Pelicitos uh, to a point where we are now able to use that. And we will be making the switch on Monday, hopefully. Uh, they're, they're, we, we've uh, set up a schedule with them and uh, Monday we're going to switch over to the Stone Dam slash Pelicito source and see what we get. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, because there we've been anxious to get in, there's a number of things that are pending at Crystal Springs that, that we have to address. There's a, a surge tank issue, there's a control issue, there's some repairs, there's a check valve issue. Uh, we've been, these, uh, and the, the blending station that had been that, that's been ongoing for a long time. We're all ready to get this going, but we have to be on Crystal Springs to do it. Right. So we're, we're poised and ready. The maintenance crews are ready to, to get this, the work done at Crystal Springs, and we are anxious to at least save a little bit of electrical money here. Yeah. And what if, if you were to make a guess with regard to Deniston, um, you know, we had sort of discussions about um, 500, 1,000, you know, what kind of production we we're going to be able to get per day out of, out of the, that water treatment plant. Where do you think we're trending or, you know, right, right now with these recent rains, was that enough to really give us an adequate flow to where we're trending up or? We're or trending we up, but for how long I cannot say, but I would venture to guess that in April, I'm hoping to get 11 or 12 million gallons out of it. Wow. which is about 50% more than we had uh, in the last month, in, in March. Great. I'm hoping. Now, how long that's going to last, it depends on when uh, uh, the farmer starts up his irrigation process and the flows in the creek. But the, the creek's flowing pretty good. I, I, we'll be able to go until July. Mm -hmm. I'm counting. Uh, you know, June will probably taper off, but I think April and May we'll get a good uh, substantial amount of water from Deniston. And, and are the Deniston wells just, uh, do they have no water or? No, they have water. Well number nine will be, will be operating. Well number one will be operating. Uh, well number four is full of iron. We can't really operate that. Uh, and we will try to, and we could get a couple of gallons a minute out of, out of well number three. So yes, we are we're moving in those directions. So, so those are my questions. I still have some comments, but maybe you have some questions. Here. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I wanted to piggyback on those because I, I see the very op optimistic uh, predicted uh, uh, 2.64 and actual 0.25 for Denison well production. So that's you know 10 for less than 10 percent. So uh, I think our prediction was a little overly ambitious there. Um, even doing even the math in the parking lot before I walk walked in here. 200 gallons a minute where we're getting out of Denison over the course of a month. 
that's nowhere near. Mm. That's averaged over, over the month. Are we running? Are we, we ran. We ran uh, Denison for 17 days in <coughs> in March, uh, and at an average of about four. Uh, 450 gallons yeah, per well, minute. The, I'm the, estimating. The math kind of works. So if it, it, over over the time, it was 200 gallons a minute. Then we have the ability to run that thing 24/7. We had a very good rain month. Yeah, we, and when we're running it, we are running it 24/7 at uh, five, four and a half, four, four to five hundred gallons per minute. But 17 days as opposed to the 30 days. That's correct. And why is that? Uh, there was uh, initially, oh, as, as I think my last report indicated, there was some control issues which we got running at the beginning of that month. Um, and in the middle of the month, oh, there was at one point where we had to turn, turn it off for a weekend for turbidity. Uh, the turbidity actually got over, over 50. Uh, the, the plant did run well between 20 and 50. It, it ran so we well. We can run it up to 50. And to use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, so yeah, and it did. It ran well up to 50, and it was running well over 50. But we're limited by by the, our, our state permit uh, to to shut off at the uh, at 50 NTU raw water. So 50 percent more. I'd sure like. I mean, I'm really gonna gonna hold you to that next month because. And we're 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 we are definitely it's it's and I think we'd like to see more. We have seven million dollars of our customers' money parked up there. And You'll get it. We want to. I mean, I know I want a return on it. I'm speaking for my you know, the customers, we want a return on this seven million dollar investment. Because I'm going to look like a real idiot. The crew I is voted for it. There are only two of us up here who voted for it. You know, we went out on a limb voting to you know spend seven million dollars. We're, we're doing everything that we can, and uh, the crews are actually, the treatment staff is enthusiastic about this facility. They see now that it's, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to run than it used to be. It's a lot more forgiving. Uh, and they, they take this as a challenge, and uh, they're going to they're gonna do it. And the optimistic predi uh, predictions on the Denison Wells? Where did that come from? That came from uh, my, I had thought that I would have had well number two uh, refurbished by now, which I have not. Uh, we have, to, and well number nine works pretty good. We could start well number five. The crew is reluctant to start well number five just because it does have 50% of the MCL for nitrate. <coughs> Uh, but blended when, once it's blended, that yeah. should not that won't be an issue. Fifty percent's not too bad. No, but it does. They do take notice. The uh, the state takes notice. But at eighty percent is when they're required to give us notice. So fifty percent is it, it's worth watching. But it's and blended is going to get knocked. Down. Yeah, yeah, it'll get knocked way down. Yeah, right. And I do know of a uh, available online nitrate monitor, a Hawk unit. That if you wanted to pick that up and put that on, I know we'll take it into consideration. But like I said, we will never run well number five solo, right? So that won't ever be no. But I mean, if you wanted the peace of mind, but yeah. not very good. So, I follow up, I wouldn't mind. I mean, I wish facilities, I don't know who's on facilities, but this is you know, I would think the facility should, should bird dog this production, and I would like to see more timely reports to facilities instead of us waiting. Waiting a, a month and you know letting a lot of water skip down that creek. Um, this is water that doesn't you know we don't have to pay San Francisco for. And, you know, I really really want to. We have a meeting on my calendar mid month this month. I think that would be a that was on my calendar. Um, I would certainly think that would be a good time to review that. Or at least, yeah, at least facilities getting you know a weekly production report yep. as opposed to waiting thirty days. Okay. Um, this is I mean I I made a couple big votes in you know thirteen years that I've been here, and this is one I don't want to regret. So I, I want to see production. Yeah, um, to follow up on the questions that I was asking, I think that's what I was uh, sort of leaning toward. Uh, also, is is I would really like to see, um, maybe maybe a uh, weekly or a bi-monthly or something, just production report, as we get things ramped up. Because 
I think what's happening in the district, and, and I appreciate it, is, is we're having issues at every one of the sources, whether it's a mechanical issue or it's a management issue or it's an operations issue or, you know, lots of issues. And that's the same with any operation. But I think that uh, especially, you know, knowing that water costs are going to go up and knowing that energy costs are going to be nexus right in with water costs, you know, and knowing that we're looking at some pretty aggressive capital improvement planning and knowing that uh, we don't really want to go too crazy on a rate increase, you know, we're going to be reviewing a, a budget tonight and, and there isn't a rate, suggested rate increase in that budget, but we know it's going to be big, or it's looking big, and I think the only way we can offset that is production and how we're producing the water. So I, I would just appreciate a more regular or active report on how that's going so I can feel confident about I think, it. I, we, could, we could definitely generate a weekly report on production and, and forward it to the board of directors. Yeah, and, it, and if, that's, if that's inappropriate, I don't have any problem with that being something that's worked out with we the don't general, have a problem with that. General manager and staff, yeah, I, I, and we get a report from the no, general manager. I don't care about that because I don't. I'm not looking to manage your activities. I just am really. When I looked at the numbers, I was frustrated because I've been really proud of how little water we've been taking for the last couple of years. In my opinion, you know, from Crystal Springs, we're getting a lot out of Pilarcitos, and it looked like we we're going to get a lot out of Deniston. And you know, I'm running around bragging that. We're really ramping up local water, and everything I read in the report says that's a lie. So I'm just concerned about saying the right thing, but exactly. I'm also concerned in making sure that I don't want to just say the right thing because I don't like what the right thing says. I want to say the, I want to make the wrong thing I'm saying right <laughs> by by activity, and <clears throat> and I know you're trying. I know there's a lot of stuff going on. I don't think it's only you. It's it's just an issue for us as a water system, I think that, that it, it looks to me like we really need to put 100% focus on production and make sure in this tough time that we get through as cheaply as we can and, and uh, just feel really strongly about it. And, and uh, you know, am I worried? No, because I know everybody has the capacity to do a good job. But I would just really love to see the numbers say what, what I believe in. Our present bottleneck at Deniston is the inability to push the water south. Right. Uh, so we, we, ha we have a pump there. It'll pump 500 gallons per minute pretty good. Uh, 600, ga 600 gallons per minute, it'll, it'll flow 600 gallons per minute. We get any higher than that, uh, there's a problem of the infrastructure down in Clipper Ridge Bridge. with uh, uh, the cast iron mains, and which, which have already burst when we, we, we uh, last month. Right. We had a we had a large uh, break over on Sunrise Court, uh, and it was directly affiliated with the turning on of the of the of the wave pump of the, of the pump that we have there. Uh, we did make a breakthrough this month uh, on a, a an obstruction in that line. Uh, we we found we think we found the obstruction. We're I'm 95 percent confident that we did and removed it. And uh, we will be running a flow test on that uh, next week, uh, to, uh, which was the only mystery that Kennedy Jenks had. They said there's something in this line which got us to, to find it, so we're going to repeat that test. And uh, that hopefully that will ha allow them to complete the hydraulic model, which will then allow them to complete a, a design for a pumping facility. Yeah, I think, that, I, I think that what I would say is all of the nuts and bolts things that are kind of going on, um, I fully understand. But then what I think is that we should be making predictions based on realities because I think we're over-predicting what we might be able to produce. So maybe the report is just a problem in prediction as opposed to a problem in production. I don't have any problem with that, but I'd like the prediction to match the production at least so that we're predicting what we're really going to do. And then, <laughs> if we have a way to ramp up what we're really doing to increase the prediction, then I think that would be fine. But I think that's part of the issue with the report is it's the variance numbers. Well, I, I'd just like to point out that we, we prepared this budget in January of 2013, and we had no idea that we would have a historically dry year. So 
and we are, I think we're really focused on trying to produce from the local sources, but if you look at Pillar Cedos Reservoir, for instance, we didn't have a significant rain between December 2012 and uh, February of 2014. So there wasn't any water. And when there was water, San Francisco drained it to Upper Crystal Springs. David Leah irrigated all the way into January. So, uh, you know, there wasn't enough water in Deniston for both of us. That's why we were shut down. And right now, uh, before these recent rains, we had to slow the slow the Deniston production down to about 450, uh, just to make sure that we balanced with how much water is going down the creek. So we're taking everything, pretty much taking everything that's coming down Deniston Creek. And so, you know, I, I hear you about the predictions, but. I think these predictions last year, they looked pretty conservative to us based on our history. And all of our plans were that we would ramp up Deniston production, both surface and groundwater, over about three years. And we're, because of the, because it's been so dry, we're a little bit behind that schedule. But um, I think, I, I think there, there are, the board is well aware of the limitations of the Deniston project and, and of our, of, the role of, you know, everything else in, in making progress on those. Um, but, you know, we didn't anticipate when we prepared this budget that, you know, we were going to have less rain than any year in recorded weather history. So, uh, but, but definitely we will, you know, that, we talk about it every day. What's Deniston doing? Are we, are we making water at Deniston? How's it going? We've had a few hiccups. I think the plant's running well. Um, I, you know, we were really pleased at, at how it responded to the high turbidity, which was one of the one of the reasons that we did that project, so we could handle high turbidity, and it did well. So, you know, I, I don't see anything. I don't see anything that would indicate that we're not going to achieve the objectives uh, that we thought we'd achieve. Um, and and we all know what some of the qualifications and risks are. So, but we hear you. We'll we'll send you a weekly report on density production. So you, you will uh, we'll keep you apprised. We understand the concern and we share it. Thank thanks, thank you very much. And that's not a directive on my part. It's just this no, was discussion. I, so I think it's a very good request on behalf of the board, and I think that it does behoove both parties, the board and the district, to be putting extra attention to all the details during this drought. And, and we have a lot of concerns in front of us. And the more attention all of us are paying, the better the, the system will work. So I, I think it's a, a good move. Any any further comments on this topic? You want a motion on that one? Uh, no, we, we, to my knowledge, we don't need one, so. Do, would you like a motion? No, we don't need, yeah. we don't need to approve it. OK, all right. Um, any meetings attended? I did a little snow survey at Kirkwood. I, and how did that go? i got to tell you, it's ramping up. Were you there this Wednesday? Uh, not this week, but the week before. There was a lot of new snow up there. Yeah. And it's really great to see the uh, top of the Sierra turn white because yeah. it's been brown for a long time. Uh, but, of course, you always want to say that special thing. That's not enough to end the drought. <laughs> but it's been great to see uh, moisture. You know, we still have April. April's still happening. I was up in, actually not far from Hetch Hetchy last week, and although it was wonderful to get six inches of snow in the in Yosemite Valley by the afternoon, that was pretty much gone, and so maybe it ran off into Hetch Hetchy. I don't know, but it, it <laughs> uphill. It didn't. Yeah, right, right. It's magic water, um, but it uh, you could tell just from the the waterfalls that it, it's not what it should be this time of year, and and the river is not what it should be this time of year. And, and that reservoir off of 120, that, I don't know if it's a reservoir actually, whether it's a, just a lake. It's a good sized lake. Uh, yeah, and it could a, just be a, a recreation reservoir. area. I don't know yeah, whether it's a reservoir. reservoir. It is a reservoir. There must be a 20 foot drop from the, the bath water. The bathtub rings are outraged. It's, it's just really almost pathetic. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, I, I did go to a Bosca meeting, although as usual, they get a little stale three weeks 
three weeks out. Um, but I did take a few notes. The, the WSIP moving along slowly, albeit. Uh, 2.6 billion, they feel they'll have spent by the end, end of this year, so leaving another 2 billion to go. Um, you know, the good news is being connected to the regional system is, and I, you know, this was prior to SFPC going to speak to the mayor. Um, he's probably not going to be very happy about their plan is to, to you know, take water from Eleanor and Cherry and forego a lot of power. And power is a big part of the city's budget, so I, I don't know what happened with the meeting with the mayor, if the mayor nixed it. But combined, uh, that's another, another hedgy. So that's a lot of water. So they would be willing to forego the power production, and they would probably be pulling uh, water from Cherry as early as October one. So that's good news for us. So it's it's not as bleak as you know, as it may sound. Um, I talked to you about Alameda a little bit, and then I did I was there a little early. Got to talk to Michael Carlin a little bit. You know, talked about budgeting. Obviously, you know, this budget is uh, process this year is going to be a little uh, little complicated in that our water sales from what they were. Um, rates going up, and you can only imagine what it is at SFPC. Um, but he did, you know, and I, I did talk about, you know, uh, pumping costs, because we're obviously pumping a lot of our water from uh, Crystal Springs right now. I don't know what how they price their power, but they'd sure like to sell us power. I don't know how much cheaper they are than pg and &E. I don't know if that's ever been considered mm. before. I'm, I'm to understand there's some pretty strong legal restraints about how San Francisco sends out who's allowed to purchase, and, and is that something you're familiar with? I'm not on the power side. Okay. Just the water. Yeah, so it was an offer on his part, whether it was a conversation or whether it's any cheaper, I don't know. I'd well, be suspect. I, I have heard that they have more... That, that, that this is an issue for them, that they have power that's available. And I've heard, and again, I, I don't, I'm not, I'd, I'd love some, some good knowledge on this, but what I've also heard is that, that one of the problems is it's not available to the general public. And, well, maybe to another utility. And another that's where agency. I would so be that, curious, that, that, that as another water agency who's a subset of their yeah. system that's it pumping would, their water, think it would be pretty clean. that, that so, may be, and yeah. wheeling through the system so that, yeah, I, I don't know, Dave, is that something we could we could make a formal request to SFPUC and see if that's that's an option for us? Sure. Okay. Find out. And they're going to go, they're setting out know, their wholesale rates in May, so there's another variable to throw, oh, into, hardly wait. throw into the equation. I can't wait to see what the new wholesale sure, rates are sure going to be. be. Uh, but that, uh, that's about it. Um, any conversation at Bosco about the mountain top? Uh, yes, I was going to ask that. No. No, we, we've, we beat that one pretty well in the last meeting. Um, now it's no just kind of, you know, it's so I still digesting this whatever six hundred million dollars. That, that letter that was sent from Bosca to SFPUC, we haven't heard anything. Bosca hasn't heard anything back from that. No, I, you know, I think that's more just for for public consumption. For yeah. 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 I, I did have a conversation with an SFPUC uh, uh, manager who discussed the tunnel project and he said the bottom line is that the initial report that said there's damage means that they will have to initiate a study mm -hmm. and that study has not been done yes it's, it's so gonna be there's a long, no there will be no process. news until that study is done and then they will have news so we we've, we've got a hey we have to study this <laughs> and now Will you know when the report is done? But at this point, the study is still being put together. How you're going to do it? Um, the I cost did, of that energy is going up, man. Oh yeah, yeah. They well, did. They the, did respond to Mosca <clears throat> and and provided a schedule for answering the questions in the in the that Bosca had asked. And but is it a year they, or two out or something? It's or so? uh, I, I don't remember what the schedule is. It's going to be drawn out. Probably right. Right. Um, Sometime in our lifetime. <laughs> oh, sure, I'll, easily. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. I'll bring it back. I'll, I'll, I'll provide you with the details. Okay. Easily. Um, I, I went to the um, uh, 
special districts meeting uh, where we elected uh, uh, new representatives. And uh, that was about it. It was a fairly clean. Where was it? Did you get elected? No, I, I carefully no, no. avoided getting elected. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the uh, it's over in um, Redwood City. Well, you have to get on an airplane then. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's it's at the it's at the uh, there's a oh, special the yeah, district yeah, okay. that's oh, one that, of them yeah, is a hospital a big, district or a meeting room. Yeah, yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that went went well, and there were two candidates, and yeah, that was it. All right. Um, why don't we start with the uh, general business section six, the uh, joint powers rate stabilization fund. Okay. We've talked a little bit before about uh, where the district gets its insurance coverage. We are participants in the Aqua Joint Powers Insurance Agency, which is a, a risk pool. Basically, we get our property and liability, our workers' compensation. Is that, uh, is, is that the list? Workers' comp, property, workers comp liability. property, liability. Right. Bring, um, bring us a big check. And it's a, it's a great deal, and I asked David to, to, to uh, pitch the JPIA a little bit. It's, uh, it's really, compared to private insurance, it's really a good deal for the agencies that participate. And he's here tonight to talk to us and to present us with a refund check, which is Great, since we need money to. <laughs> David, you can imagine how much Thank fun you. I have handing out money. Yeah. So <laughs> everybody's happy about that. Um, That's a big check. President Reynolds, uh, members of the board, General Manager Dixon, the staff. I, my name is Dave Hodgen. I'm a elected board member, as you are. Except my district, is, my agency is the Scotts Valley Water District, um, and. I know you'd be surprised, but we spent a lot of time talking about water sources and, and uh, availability. Uh, so uh, hearing your earlier comments, it felt right at home. So. Uh, I wear several hats. Uh, for the last, uh, this is, I think I'm in my seventh year now as the uh, president or vice president of Region 5, which is the Central Coast Region for the Association of California Water Agencies. And so your agency is part of Region 5. So I've been representing you, although I've never been up here uh, before. Um, I also uh, serve on the Aqua Board, a statewide board, and I serve on the executive committee of the Joint Powers Insurance Authority. So I, I have all these various hats. So if you have questions about any of those things, supposedly I would know an answer to give you, and I'd do, do my best on that. Uh, as we were saying, the Joint Powers Insurance Authority is really a, it's kind of like a co-op or a pool. Uh, it serves only water districts. And so everybody in the organization is very much up to speed on issues relating to water uh, districts. And we cover uh, the vast majority of the uh, water districts in the state, except for the extremely large ones who could do things by themselves. So we, the middle size and smaller agencies are the ones that we serve. Because it's a pool, every one of the 465 districts or whatever it is uh, has their own uh, account with the Joint Powers Insurance Authority. And you pay in a premium, which is estimated in advance, kind of like your budgeting in January of 2013. You based it on what you knew then. Um, we ask you to pay that premium but we also then keep track of all the uh, expenses that are related to your agency. And those are deducted from the premium you've paid in. Periodically, um, the, um, it's a five-year uh, calculation. When your uh, balance in your account exceeds 50% of your annual premium, then the surplus is rebated back to you. And the agency could do that because there are no stockholders to pay, and it's a nonprofit organization, so there's no taxes to pay. So we're, it's a really a very efficient operation. And so when you do a good job here in the district and don't spend as much as your premium is, you get that money back. Um, and that would be something quite different than most insurance companies. 
I brought with me tonight, uh, tonight uh, some little packets of information about JPIA. Uh, I think I have six of them here so that you can take it and take a look at it. Uh, there are really a lot of membership benefits. The uh, uh, JPIA piggybacks on Aqua's conference uh, twice a year and has public meetings. So this Tuesday, the first weekend, our first uh, week in May, I believe it is, uh, there will be JPIA meetings in Monterey. Uh, you're, I'm sure you're all aware that the conference is coming up very shortly. What is it? Just it's just a month from now, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I hope that many of you will uh, plan to attend. And the Aqua events are primarily Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday morning breakfast. But if you come in on Tuesday, you can participate in some very good meetings from the Joint Powers Insurance Authority. And if you want to come in on Monday, then uh, that's when the Aqua or the JPIA board meets and conducts its business twice a year. And every agency has a member of that board. I'm, not, I'm sorry I said, I don't know who the member is. You're the member of the board? Good. I hope you all see you there then on that Monday. Um, let's see, what else should I say? Oh, I look back to see, uh, there are a lot of free services that the uh, JPIA can provide. There are all sorts of training programs, and, and you'll see the material I have here that that's available. And all of that stuff is available to your staff and to the members of the board without any charge. And so it's you know kind of silly not to take advantage of it. And I hate to report that the giant lending library, which we have with all kinds of training materials and so forth in it, um, I couldn't find any items that have been taken out of the library by your agency. Uh, there's a professional development program primarily for staff and with a lot of good courses uh, a lot of them focused on safety and how to reduce our, our potential liabilities. Um, you did have three participants on this list that I found. Um, their total their target solutions, participants in courses, zero. Total number of staff attending JPIA classes, uh, well, I won't go down the list, but I would encourage you to participate because there is no cost. The, court, the classes are great. Uh, and your agency will benefit from, from uh, what's learned there. And that applies to staff that's not here. I mean, field staff and so forth. There are classes for them as well. So um, I think that's probably enough of, of that, unless you have some questions for me. I do. Yes. So um, the, the refund or rebate that we're getting tonight, mm -hmm. is that a joint rebate from both the p &L and the yes. workers' comp side. Right. And I'm turning over to your general manager a, a whole bunch of paperwork here with the actual check. And it's each of those items is listed, so you will be able to see how much you have for each of those. And does the, a, the agency do periodic annual or biannual inspections of facilities for purposes of making recommendations for on the P&L. Absolutely. And, and you probably have someone yes. calling on you mm -hmm. about uh, twice, but once a year? Once a year, twice? Does that happen twice? So twice a year? They come once a year. Yeah. Once a year. Yeah. And then every couple of years just for an, uh, a renewed assessment of all of our assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And hopefully that's that's a, another thing that you would consider a real benefit, because they're not here to you know create any trouble for you. They're here to point out things that you may not have seen, because you see it every day. And um, so they are hope, hoping to point out things that you might want to take care of, and also to make suggestions of something that they've seen in another district that worked really well there, and might very well work in your district, too. So when, when you're doing the, uh, the agency is doing its estimates of premiums for the member district. Mm -hmm. um, are you using some kind of an XMOD factor over, say, a three-year period of time? Yeah. So that if there's a claim, like in this case we've got a claim going, um, that's going to show up in probably most likely a bump in our premiums, but it may be two years down the road before it hits the fat the formula, right? That's correct. And the, those premiums are based on the overall experience of all the, the members of the pool. Um, and so a rebate indicates that you're doing better than the pool average. So you're doing better than anticipated. 
if you did worse, then we might come back to you for some more money. Asking for so what's bigger? It's, 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 yeah. it's a pool. You know? so, yeah, we can. Uh, but, but we're that, glad to see you. That's not the case in your agency. So I have uh, I have here a small check for you. Look at this check. Here. Oh. <laughs> wow, twenty three grand. Okay. And so you're getting twenty three thousand dollars, twenty three what is it, twenty three three thousand one hundred and forty five dollars back tonight. And I think it would be great to have a little photo op, maybe uh, the president and the general manager, or who yeah. would you like to have in yeah. such a picture? Yeah. I think the whole board is done <laughs> this, but <laughs> okay. yeah, let's, can we figure out a place to do this? Yeah. Uh, well, we're CBS live on camera. I mean, I think the entire world is watching. On, on. <laughs> Everybody will think it's the Cabrillo right Unified there. School That's District. <laughs> <laughs> we should stand over here so they don't think it's the school district. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, good. They want to call them for their money. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Put your hand on that There we go. Well, let's see. Why don't, why don't we get both of you on both right. sides? Yeah. Yeah. Staff and board representative are in the middle here. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think we got to get so, it. We need Joe. We need yeah, Joe. We need Joe. We need Joe. Keep for posterity here. Oh, good. More board members. All right. Oh, squeeze on in. Yep. Got to get closer. All right. Yeah, I'll take it tomorrow. <laughs> Here's one the no bank problem. will be happy to have. Right now, you Congratulations. I think you guys got to be really proud. Congratulations. Great job oh, managing the district. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming. It's a real tribute. Five years. It's fun to give away. That was really five years. There are lots of crews that can blow up this kind of policy. for some modifications to our administration building. It was sort of a first cut. And uh, in the last month, we've been talking with uh, various folks, contractors, people who would uh, do the furniture, uh, things like that. And we also sat down and sort of went through an exercise of what's the benefit, do we really need this? So I just outlined in my staff report some of the objectives that we had in mind in, in looking at these changes. Uh, one was to change the change the public entry and customer service area now. Uh, any, everybody who comes in can wander through the office and distract everybody. You know, it's like, hey, how you doing? And everybody has to respond. So um, every all the office people feel like that would be a benefit. Um, we want to provide an additional office to accommodate a future uh, additional management level. We're really, I think, talking about the next at 
least the next 10 years uh, trying to make this building work for us. As we said, if we really look at our needs, it's not adequate. The whole site is not adequate, we don't think. Uh, we want to provide additional, open things up and provide additional areas where we can use furniture and partitions to create workspaces uh, for the administrative staff. We want to improve the mechanical systems. We have Right now we have two heating systems and, and uh, just about everybody has a little space heater in their office and wears a coat all the time. Uh, except for me, who's always too hot and turning the thermostat down so that, that makes everybody else cold. So um, we, think that, we think that can be improved and we actually have a proposal and, and pricing for that improvement. And uh, last but not least, we want to provide suitable space for our servers and other uh, equipment. So we've, we've really been looking at a lot of details in the last month. And, um, John Evans is here. Um, we wanted to uh, just share with you our latest, our latest iteration, which is far less ambitious, I guess, in terms of construction than what we showed before. We really look at what does do we really get anything out of opening the space up and taking out these walls? So what you see on this uh, 11 by 17 is our current plan. The walls in red in the lower left are the ones we, we would take out, and we're, we're going to replace that window system on the south side of the building. And the, you've got the detail of what we're going to do. We've really gotten it down to, to a very limited construction project. you wanted to say about what we've, uh, what we've done here? You don't have to. I think we've really focused on what 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 work could be done now since... Oh, yeah, that's here. Right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. John Evans and I had that now. I'm going to direct the room um, we've, we've tried to really focus on since the building is completely empty right now, there are some practicalities uh, around that that we'd like to take advantage of, uh, not necessarily just generating work because we want to do some work. And so in that process, it was really clear that there are a few minor improvements, changing the way the current boardroom is configured. And that means demolishing the room that's now kind of a where the safe is and kind of archival storage behind a locked door. Um, originally, in the uh, the first time the building was built back in 1970, that building that has a safe now that's next to Gina's office and between the boardroom and Gina's office was actually part of the director's office. So that wall that's there was actually not a wall at all. It was doors that opened and closed for the director could be into the original boardroom. So, so demolishing and taking that wall out is uh, meaningless in terms of the structural work. And then we looked at a little bit of demolishing where the uh, file storage is now between where your uh, uh, monitoring stations are and uh, the current administrative space. And that also is not uh, structurally anything uh, significant. So all of those spaces could be opened up, uh, reconfigured, and work with modular furniture. The, the place where we were having a little bit of kind of struggling back and forth, and I think the reason we took a little bit longer um, to kind of finalize this sort of proposal is the area around the bathrooms and the fire itself. Um, there's more there, it's more complex. There were some solutions where we could really open up a lot of space, but it meant doing a little bit of work with bathroom, the women's bathroom. And the bottom line, we kind of looked at, you know, if we spend $50,000 redoing a toilet, and all we have is more space, but we don't, it's not more functional space. It's not really worth spending the money just to make more accessible hallways and more flexible space Did, uh, able to kind of look at and have uh, reconfigured where the room was where the uh, fire happened. We can make a more permanent office there as well as access the mechanical space. So sorry to just kind of ramble on about that, but it, it's kind of interesting. We're kind of working harder to make less work, and, and, and I think we've done a pretty good job of that. So what re is reflected on this drawing is work that would be impacting the district that's not reimbursed by the fire uh, the, uh, insurance agency that's covering. There is more, more scope of work, but it's not included. 
So we're trying to be able to look at what's going to actually cost the district some money. Because there, there is a, more work being done to repair the fire damage. And there is some uncovering of um, asbestos materials that really doesn't affect the project other than it's just a little more expensive to do the demolition. And actually kind of lucky to find that right now. And it's a, the floor of the mechanical room and um, the, popcorn ceiling. the popcorn ceiling in the, in the lobby space. And that's not, doesn't change the plan at all. It's not difficult to um, reconfigure that with paint or you know, something. So it's good to, it's actually good to find that now because it's relatively less expensive to redo. And I'm glad to answer any questions. Um, I had a question. In looking at the plan, I, I'm assuming this is the floor plan finish. Yeah. Um, this office space right here looks like it's closed off from the rest of it. Well, there's a. I can see that in that graphic, there's a, a door that's not shown in that graphic. And there's a. That's a wall. There's a door there, right where you're. Okay, so that, this, this just isn't right. It's Joe's office now. Yeah, yeah that's why I wonder where we're locking him into <laughs> his own space it's and hiding him into the exterior. Thank you. Right, so it's correct. In the larger drawing, it's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So you could walk into Joe's there, but you couldn't get to. <laughs> I was just wondering, Joe, is that something you'd come up with? Yeah, I came up with this. Uh, I, 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 I think it's a great idea. It's it's good. Good. And then, I'm assuming that that's your parking space, is it? People were stealing his jelly beans. Oh. Uh, the other question I had for you is, you didn't really like the idea of wiping out the double door access here, turning that into more space. One in the back. Right here, that comes off the parking lot. We look. We talked about that. We looked at it. Um, those are those are brick walls there. They're structural, I think. Those two. The space is too narrow. Oh, it's not wide. Enough. Yeah, it's not wide enough. It's, a, it's only a little over six feet wide. Oh, okay. And my other question was, would it be possible to kind of label, you know, what task might be in each one of the sure, areas? Sure. Is that is that sort of the next step, I guess? Right? Yeah. Okay. So we we've envisioned this space we've freed up in what's now the boardroom as an operations space because it's easily accessible from the from the parking lot and that's where we can set up some workstations for the field crew and have their SCADA. You know, we're thinking of having the central SCADA monitors in there so that it'll be kind of a, a field operations center, which is something we can't really accommodate now. Yeah, cool. So, um, but, but as you'll see when we talk about CIP, this isn't really the long-term solution for the district. I think we need to keep on the table if this kind of facility isn't quite adequate for our needs. I saw so, that in the budget. Yeah, so we are we are uh, moving toward. I think starting this work, we'll be back in May with a I think a detailed proposal and, and approach for contracting this. It isn't enough work that the contractor. Hiring somebody is available and doing it on a time and material basis. It's a pretty small job. And and we've got someone who can manage it and help us with carpet and finish it and things like that. And the, and the furniture that's going to go in it. We're going to be spending something on furniture. Uh, we don't know the numbers in terms of how much the insurance will cover, but the insurance is really covering a lot of the costs that we would otherwise experience. All the costs for moving out, all the costs for moving JPIA just paid $20,000 to replace a copier. Uh, so they've been very, uh, they've been really good. I mean, they haven't really argued with any claim that we've made. Uh, so the, the insurance will cover quite a bit of this. And um, so we think it'll be a pretty reasonable project and, and really produce some, really produce some benefits. We'll be back in May with, with a specific uh, approach and numbers. So when you say, you know, someone just oversee it, um, her name is Pat Delgavio. She runs a company that does TI improvements. They they did all the partition systems for City Hall. They've always done, they provided all of our office furniture and partitions, but she did it for Sam. So you have a had a working relationship with yeah, them. Yeah. And they were very impulsive of their work. Right. Yeah, she's done a very good job for us. And their crews, their crews were the ones that came over and disassembled everything and moved it into the modular. 
For example, a mechanical system would be a design build of a big contract. So there's just a little bit of carpentry moving a few walls, a little bit of electrical patching, and those that small scope work would be more efficient than a budget of time and materials based. That would be to a complex spec package, we haven't even done the forensic of the methods there. Relatively small scale of cost for, for that portion of it. Yeah, the last plan we saw was a little spendy. comparison of the old boardroom to the new one in terms of seating capacity? It's almost identical. It is. Okay. The, the room is about a foot more narrow. Okay. Than it's okay. It'll be cozier. Yeah. We got a fireplace. <laughs> but uh, as long as we don't propose any cell towers. Yeah, we'll, we don't need it. We'll have different. We'll have different furniture. Oh. Okay. Uh, and. And that was a lot of space that got used two hours a month. So yeah. um, we think this will be a, even, even though it will be a little cozier, it's not going to be a good uh, change. The question I would ask is, is there, can that room be configured to be a training room for staff when we're not in it? I mean, our, uh, the, the activities that I could think of using for that are training room, um, and then I'm out of, I, up with any other options, but but are, are there any other options, things that, because it now would be the time if we could think about what other purposes that room could have. It bugs me to have a room we only use two hours a, a month. We, we projected that would be used every morning for the morning uh, maintenance crew. So a coffee machine. Well, I <laughs> don't know about that. <laughs> also it's used for um, all the uh, small conferences that happen almost daily with either a person from the public or one of the uh, uh, office assistants that needs to have a, a small conference with two or three people. So it's going to be used on an ongoing basis like that because it can be closed in private. Okay. But, uh, and the furniture we have now makes it kind of exactly. difficult to do right. that sort of thing. But so we'll, we'll be do incorporating right. more furniture like this. Re right. set up so it'd be more. Yeah, we like this. With the jacket yeah, that, can be, that can be reconfigured. Okay. And more monarch chairs. You know. I do like nice chairs. These are pretty nice chairs. These are nice chairs. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much for coming. And this looks like um, looks like a, a, this is certainly a, I, I was unable to make the last meeting, but this is a, a I like this plan a great deal. So looking at this, and I really appreciate the trim down. Um, efficiencies. The spot in between the work island and the courtyard door that has the two structural posts in it, is there, what's the thought there? Um, seems like a lot of space that doesn't yeah, have we much have, uh, in, a, in another drawing, uh, we configured some field crew workspaces in there. Oh, okay. So we haven't, I don't think we've fully thought through how we might use that space, mm -hmm. but the idea is that it's open and can be configured with furniture, basically. We have, okay. we do have a field crew coming in and filling out reports and things like that, and mm -hmm. we need to provide a space for that. And that, that may be where it makes sense to do that, because that's where they come in and would interface with the office. So we're also thinking about putting some different floor in there, where these guys track in major amounts of mud. That makes sense. Yeah, well, maybe we put in a wash station, you know. <laughs> slippers. Oh, that, yeah, slippers. <laughs> <laughs> well, or or there's a sign that says no vibram sole. No, but sometimes at the entrance you'll see a steel grate, you know, with yeah, a right. with a, like a scrubbing system for the heavy <clears throat> boots. So. They walk right over that with the mud anyway. So, so, so <laughs> we haven't thoroughly, you know, this is this is still under discussion. But the important thing is it's it's. Uh, configurable and reconfigurable with movable stuff, furniture basically. Well, I appreciate your, your effort to it. It looks good. You can see why John Evans has been a successful 
architect for a long time. Great job. It's good. Appreciate it. Yeah, you do a really wonderful job. And, and thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate the, the in person presentation. And the model, when is that going to be ready? <laughs> Time See, visits last week. This actually is a digital model. You mean the 3D? Uh, yeah, it's like pushing little cars around. You know, they have little cars in the tree. That's what that isn't that check for that? Is that what they do? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. Dave, you're ready to tell us about the letter of support for Senate Bill 1345. That's really exciting. Okay. Bosca has asked us to send a letter signed by the president of our board supporting their efforts on Senate Bill 1345. Uh, this would extend the bill that provides for state oversight of the WISA program. Sometimes more successful in the courts and in the legislature than in negotiations with, with San Francisco. Those relations are much more cordial now, but uh, this would uh, extend the formal oversight that's, uh, that the state legislature provided for to cover the extended time period of the WISP program. And the district's policy, this goes back a ways, but people will remember the district's policy. Uh, regarding letters to be signed by a board member or by the president is that uh, the board needs to approve uh, the letter before it goes out on district letter. Yes, this is quite a discussion <laughs> with that one. So, and that's why it's here. But it's, a, it's definitely a, something we should do. Okay. Can I take a quick head count? Or? Oh, I just have a question. Okay. Just for background. So, who actually does I think it's kind of through the, it's Bosca through the state. It's, it's Bosca through the authority of the state. Oh. That's my impression of how it works, but I, I don't know the details. And I, I think one of the challenges is that, that San Francisco kind of runs their own water system, so the state they feel very comfortable auditing themselves, and I think the idea is to have some assistance. They audit themselves in the same way they audited their school bus. supporting this letter. Yeah, I don't think they're all, I would say editorial. Well, we're school board yeah, members under indictment. I see the Just as an editorial comment, I mean, generally, I think writers to support legislation are kind of useless until they do. Everybody's trying to make sort of seems like one that's doing. Do, do we want to um, add anything to encourage the uh, project to be completed so we don't have to have another discussion? <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's getting a little scary because you understand that, you know, from 15, which was the original solution date, 100%, to, you know, getting pushed out this far, it's, it's frightening. And, of course, the costs aren't going down with the extension of time. Yeah, uh, I worry less about the time than I do the money. I, I just, uh, so anyway, that, that's just my comment. When did they start the project? Oh, my gosh, you know, the uh, EIR started. Construction started in 2000, 2008, 2009. Six years. I thought it was 05, I believe. Wasn't it 05 or so? They started way before that. Oh, yeah. 2005 was when they put the projects, kind of put the projects together and started on the programmatic EIR, which got certified in 2008, I think. It's almost a billion dollars in the EIR. But if a lot of things got approved, it was great. It really was a, a, an amazing job of working with everyone. I mean, that was the best thing. You know, the uh, new River Trust, I mean, all the players were there. So it was, it, it was really a terrific expense of California. Mm -hmm. Chris, any, any thoughts on this? Not that I live in the state of California. <laughs> <laughs> I can guide 
right to one line of that. No, um, no, no, the approval of the letter. <laughs> yeah, the approval of the letter. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, bring it in, bring it being in. as the Bosca area covers a greater uh, population and geographic area, we have more friends in the state of Sacramento. State of Sacramento. State of Sacramento. Uh, so we have more representatives on our side of the river. So, so this is, it's, a, it's a formality, you know, all the Bosca agencies should certainly do this. Uh, we're pretty confident that this is good work and it is good. But certainly this is just absolute formality. Sure. Do we need a, can we do an I or an A or a? a we have a motion. Oh, yeah. Authorize the president to sign this letter yep. and in support of Central Two, uh, one, three, four, five. Thank you. One, three, four, five. And then second. Five, four, two, so, yeah. all in favor, say aye. 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 You want me to sign this one or one more? Form? I have a good one. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Okay, quarterly year to date financial review. I believe it's the uh, end of the third quarter already. We we'll just get started on it. We're coming down the home stretch in the third quarter of the year. Uh, basically, as I pointed out, the bottom line is we're, we're ahead of the net revenue line a little bit. But um, that changes from this changes. Looking at three quarters year to date, we're a little bit ahead of our water sales budget, about 4%. And uh, as has happened in most years, we're ahead of non operating revenue due to a higher than expected ERAP refund and a little bit more property tax in the year. Property tax is pretty predictable. We haven't figured out any way to predict ERAP. We used to budget 100000 and then we budget, start budgeting 200000 In terms of operating expenses, so our total revenues are ahead of budget by about 6%. In terms of operating expenses, harking um, back to our earlier discussions, no surprise that we're way over budget on San Francisco water purchase. And since we've been on Crystal Springs, well over budget on, on pumping expenses. And those are really the big things that are pushing our expense budget out of whack. Uh, at the bottom line, those San Francisco cost overruns are balanced by some other underruns, and at the bottom line, we're about 182,000 behind our budget. But that's more than offset by the uh, over budgeted revenue. So we're doing okay. We're more or less on plan. So for future budgeting purposes, on the ERAP refund, um, do, you, do you ever anticipate that it would go below that 200,000? We've anticipated it. We've anticipated for a long time that it would go away. Right. Again, how that works. Yeah. Do we know? <coughs> it's a guess every year. I yeah. think the most interesting thing is when we budget at 100000 we get X amount, like double that. So we budget 200000 that's up to 333 Let's budget 300 yeah. and see if we go to 400000 I mean, that's basically you know, That's my recommendation. This is a good process. <laughs> yeah, the county can never give me a... An estimate. It's the black box. What is it nice to Yeah, it is. I think we got 345 last year. Did we get about 345 last year? No, it was in the 200s. 200. Yeah. So it's, it's way up. Yeah. I don't know. The state's in good shape. Any questions about that? Sounds good. And I think it looks great. I mean, considering how variable. The reality is, I think the budget's you know, falling in a good spot. I mean, we really celebrating that. I think we are very happy about it. But it's because of the good character management. You know why we budget? the TV. Mm -hmm. You can see these things up with two letters. 
Well, I decided not. I decided to do virtual PowerPoint tonight. <laughs> for opinions about whether it should be on eight and a half by eleven and okay. as definite no. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to talk budget? Uh, well we've talked we've talked about our budget process for this year, which is a little bit delayed from what we normally do because we had so much uncertainty. And it seems that as we have gone along here, some of that uncertainty is resolved. San Francisco said unequivocally at the meeting we had with the Bosco Water Service Water Management representatives last week that we would be on voluntary 10% voluntary at least through this calendar year. So until the end of the year, we're going to be on voluntary 10%. That was a major uncertainty for us in, in trying to prepare there weren't really any qualifiers that came along with that, but we all still need to understand that San Francisco can do anything it wants, any time it wants. So we have been waiting for sort of this April 15th shoe to drop on the water shortage emergency mandatory rationing for San Francisco. That's not going to happen. Doesn't mean they're in good shape. They're in better shape than they than they might have thought they were going to be. Not have been a lot worse. There's been some precipitation in Hetch that makes them optimistic. They've got these emergency projects going at the Cherry and Eleanor that they'll be using to provide some more water. So we think that we think that uncertainty in our budget has uh, has resolved. So that's a good thing. Uh, we've given you the expense budget. Instead of filling trees by making all those copies of the supporting sheets, we refer you to the website. That's okay uh, for a couple of these, at least for a couple of iterations of the budget. Uh, we'll, we'll keep doing that. If anybody at any time would like to have a printed copy, we're happy to make them deliver. And we'll have some available for the public. People will just prefer to get printed copies. There will be, it's marked draft. There will be changes. So just reviewing what's coming, this is our first presentation of the budget. I hadn't planned a detailed discussion uh, tonight, uh, but we will have that discussion at our special meeting.
components of the budget process and how we get from the budget to the rate increase. And we've presented with the operations and maintenance budget. So that's really pretty straightforward from year to year. Uh, this year, there's some fairly significant year over year increases in expenses. Partly that's because last year's budget didn't get revised to include the additional treatment distribution operator position that the board approved. So that, that uh, adds something to the year-to-year the -year difference, which is showing at the bottom line here is about 14% from budget to budget. Of course, a major part of that increase is a San Francisco water purchase, about $600,000 in San Francisco water purchases in addition to what we purchased over what we purchased this year. San Francisco's rate increase would be about 19.6%. Um, and so that's fairly significant for us. We've also been fairly conservative, as uh, will be uh, discussed in more detail later, uh, with our water use projections and, and the amount of water we're going to produce from local sources. You'll see that we have lowered the projections of local source production versus the 20. 14 budget. So we don't, if, if we get into the next October, November, and we don't get some pretty significant rains in the fall, things are going to be pretty uh, tough entering as we get into December and January. We're really going to need some precipitation to turn our local sources around. Uh, so <clears throat> we've, we've made some fairly conservative assumptions about local source production. That has resulted in, a, in some pretty big numbers for San Francisco what it purchased. Can I ask a question about that specific sure. timeline? Uh, so the 2.3 million um, water purchase, did that, did that increase over this year pretty much a reflection of the 19% increase in San Francisco? It, it, it's both that increase as well as a change in the amount of water that we think we're going to use. Okay. That, that, that was really my concern was because we've used so much more than we had anticipated this year is, is an increase over what we had anticipated when we budgeted last year included in so it reflects the increased use that we would have this year over last year yes okay. yeah so what our approach is first we we look at water sales this year versus what we projected, the volume sales. And uh, this, is a, this is a process that, that Joe does. He's got uh, some magic formulas. It, it's really a, uh, there's art and science and, and guessing involved. But uh, what he's done is uh, taken a look at what we projected uh, the last year, uh, what we had year to date, basically, that we look at, the fiscal year to date, the ratio of actual to projected. And then he uses that ratio, year to date ratio of actual to projected to project the coming months, uh, the, the months of the fiscal year yet to come. And then uh, this year, we took the numbers that resulted from that and reduced them by 10% across the board voluntary reduction. So, so we start out by, by predicting volume, water volume that we're going to sell. And then we divide that by one minus the percentage of lost water, which is what, 9%? It's about 7%. 7%. That, that varies quite a bit. So there, you know, there's, a, there's a number that's, that's important that you know, can vary quite a bit. So we use that to get to our production. So we, we know what our total water production need will be. And then we take a look across all of our sources and try to figure out you know, how much we're going to be able to get from each source. And you'll see all the detail in the supporting in the budget supporting sheets, how much we predicted we'd get from density. So we really we dropped I think we dropped the prediction well for Denniston from a total of about 170 million last year to about 140 million, something like that. So we dropped it pretty significantly in terms of what we said we 
So, so that's so so that's the process. So, I mean, I, I guess the long way around is the numbers that you see for San Francisco water purchase come out of that exercise. How much water do we need total? How much water will our local sources produce? Um, those assumptions have us using more San Francisco water. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of a double check. It's more, it's more San Francisco water and it's a cost increase. So generally I would figure that uh, San Francisco, that the rate increase that we need to cover the cost of San Francisco water is about uh, the same proportion to San Francisco's rate increase as, as our San Francisco water purchase is to our total expenses. So given that that's about one, three, one, four, if San Francisco raises its cost 20%, and we need about a 5% rate increase, if all else being equal to break even. If we use more San Francisco water, then we're gonna get a little bit more of a rate increase to cover just that. Um, so that's the expense budget, and we can answer questions about uh, any aspect of this. Another big number in here that um, you'll see is we've got um, study surveys and consulting, <laughs> an in a big increase, uh, and, and there's detail on that. A lot of that is uh, money for a, uh, um, a, what do we call it, a lead study of? Uh, water loss control. Water loss control. Water loss control audit. Uh, we're going to hire a firm that specializes in, in the standard procedure for water loss control audits, uh, and they're going to help us find where that nine percent is going and suggest ways to uh, lower it. Which which line item is that? That is uh, so fifty-three eighteen. Yeah, so that was another. Pretty significant number that stands out. Down in the blues. In the, back, in the board house. So uh, there is nothing other than reducing our projections of water sales volume by 10%. There isn't really anything in this budget specifically aimed at drought or mandatory rationing. If that happens, we're going to be back with a revision of the budget, I think, whenever it does, and hopefully at that time we'll be able to come in with the, with the drought rate studies that HFMH is, is preparing um, as a basis for adjusting our rates. And is there anything in here for any additional positions? Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Sorry. Okay. I didn't, I, you know, I, I haven't included that, although I'd like to talk about it. Um, I didn't, we didn't include it in the budget because it's not approved, but, but it's in the financing plan. So, uh, the financing plan, which is the eight and a half by 11 sheets, you'll see at the back of that our famous uh, graph. Don't worry, we'll fix this. When the numbers are small, you want these on 11 by 17 the next time? That's what my TV's on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So uh, our finance model basically produces a series of rate increases and borrowings that keep the district reserve above our policy level, which is 15% of what we have net operating, net operating revenue, or operating revenue. So uh, it's really pretty simple. We take, uh, if you look at the cash flow projection, which is the third sheet in, We've got projected year-end 2013-14. And these, these, this column pretty much matches the projected year-end numbers on, on the top sheet of the budget. So we've got projected year-end 13-14 expenses. Uh, we've got uh, all of we, we've got the projected total expenditures on everything else, debt service and capital projects. The capital projects projection comes from the CIP status report. Uh, so we basically roll all that together to project what the year-end reserve balance would be, and then we carry that projection forward. So, could I ask you a question on this sheet? Which one? Um, oh yeah, this one. Okay. Yeah. When you're on the cash flow, uh, I don't really remember 
what we finally used as a, a, a rate increase this year. What was it? Seven. Seven percent. Yeah. So you, and then the years prior to that, do you have any memory for a couple more years back? Yeah, I'll give you, I, I should, um, I made a little table which I didn't bring with me, but uh, before seven it was 12 and before that it was 12. Right. So it went 12, 12, seven. Yeah, because originally at that time we had suggested that we were going to go 12, 12, 12, 12 right. and then start to drop right. down. But we got into this, we got So each year we project, and I'll, I can present this next time, each year we projected a, a, a new series of rate increases. You know, generally rate increases in, in the near years <coughs> uh, as we move forward have been greater than what we predicted for that year and previous years financing. Six million new CIP projects in this state. Yes, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> right. But anyway, so thanks. Yeah, that's why. Um, so, so what we can talk about one of the things that's uh, included in here that is not in the budget that uh, we'll talk about next time that I that I have uh, uh, discussed with the, the both the finance committee and the HR committee. The idea of having an additional uh, position, um, an assistant manager finance, uh, finance uh, director position, and so that is built into this. Uh, if you look at the operating expense sheet, which is page two, uh, the highlighted one in there. So it's built. I built that position into the into the long term cost scenario, assuming that the cost of that. Well, again, that's the total cost of the position. It's not somebody's salary. Down the line. Yeah, our cheapest, our cheapest positions are on the order of 120 to 150. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and that, so that's all the costs. Yeah. Like all the positions. Right. Yeah. I, I have a question on the studies and the consulting. East Bay Mud and San Francisco both invested about hundred thousand dollars to buy correlate. They can drive through and assess past and, and assess their leak detection. And the, the advantage that was explained to me in that project was that it allows <coughs> you to continuously monitor and fine tune your system in perpetuity because you own the hardware and the staff knows it better than anyone else. And I've ridden with them, and it's a you know it's a 15 minutes to collect the data, and then it pops up on the screen and maps. The leaks, and I was really impressed that that, that and, and as I look at the money spent on this, I'm sure consultants are nice folks, but wouldn't that is that something we've looked at and could compare before we trot out with this firm to to give them a one time check that they won't have we then have to hire them again. I think it'd be good if they. I kind of have the same question, and we met with them, and I uh, I felt much more comfortable that this was something we'd get real value out of, um, and it would be good if I, I think if they came and presented to the board at the time we want to. Yeah, I, I'd like that because I, I I was very. And I think that's that's a good question. The and and Kathleen may have some comments on this, but I think they will. The way that it's described, they will do this initial study, but then leave us with a program to manage ourselves because it's an on, it's an ongoing yeah. thing. They will have some very specific uh, suggestions. Um, the examples he gave were, well, you know, we can create more pressure zones or turn the pressure in our pressure zones down. I know that you that's something that you've mentioned, um, but uh, so, so there's. Some, some very, you know, I, I think you know, these guys are the experts and, and have done this work for a lot of different agencies. And with water, 
San Francisco water now costing you know, three over three dollars a unit. Um, being able to identify where we have leaks is very cost effective. Now my question was, well, you know, we already know we have an awful lot of pipes to repair, and we know they're leaking. Well, aren't you just going to be telling us something we already know? You know go fix your pipes. Um, I mean, one of the things they do is it's more than just real losses. I mean, they look at the total system and so that you get an idea of what your apparent losses are, what your real losses are, so you know where to, uh, you know, where to focus to reduce you know, your non-residue water. You know, they, it, they break it down and do component analysis and, you know, they start right at your source and follow it through treatment, you know, all the way to the delivery to the customer. So you get a really holistic approach to it as opposed to just focusing in on, uh, you know, tracking leaky pipes. You know, it's, it's a more holistic approach. And it, it's based on, you know, AW Bisbee rates uh, M36 manual and that methodology. Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with the, the M36 manual. And it's a, it's a best management practice. Yes. validate our data, you know, our metering and calibration, and, you know, it really looks at everything. So you get a really good idea of your whole system. And it's a, it, it's a, there's a significant commitment of staff effort as well to this overall study. You want to talk about the CIP? Well, sheets I got, I can read them off. Yeah. <laughs> well, as we've said before, it's really this the CIP that that drives rate increases. And a couple of days over the weekend, Director Glassberg sent me an email and said, "Have there been any? Are there any changes in the year-to-year -year CIPs?" And you know, I've been struggling for a while now to try to make a better presentation of the CIP to, to really help us understand what changes. I said, well, yeah, there have been a few changes. And after I did this report, which is this thing on top called the CIP budget comparison the previous year, um, there have been a lot of changes to the, to the projects in the CIP, not just, not just a few additions, but uh, we sit down with the CIP and say, well, you know, what do we know about this project? What new ones have come up? Um, what's been our experience with similar projects? And so you'll see in this first three pages, uh, actually the first five, the red numbers at the right indicate uh, projects that have changed from last year's CIP to this year's CIP and, and how much they've changed. Um, some of them, a, a few have gone down, but at the bottom line, we now have a, a, a $32 million CIP. It's always been ten years, okay. and, and we really struggle with the with the out years. Uh, you know, it, when we get out there, they're kind of just placeholders. Uh, but, it, but it means they're on the radar, which right. is a reasonable thing right. to do. And, so. and an excellent example of something that's on the radar is uh, this um, uh, district administration operations center, which we stuck in. Farthest out of year, you know, just as a placeholder, of three million dollars. Um, if you look at the, if you look at the cash flow projection, you see that uh, that <clears throat> that would be covered by district reserves at that time, as opposed to borrowing. It really doesn't make a big difference in the near-term rate increases, whether it's in or out. But it's just something that we felt. Changes in this. One was, uh, as 
advanced metering infrastructure. We've been talking with vendors uh, that's in uh, facilities and maintenance project uh, 0907. Uh, we increased that by 1.7 million. We've been talking with some vendors uh, and <coughs> We envision uh, a five-year, kind of a five-year program of improvements <laughs> to our utility billing and our metering, starting with in the first year, most likely a change in our soft in our utility billing software. So, by changing utility billing software. That'll be that will happen more or less at the same time with our transition to all monthly billing, which we'll do uh, without automatic meter reading, and then uh, automated meter reading, whether it's advanced metering infrastructure or just automated meter reading, uh, would come in, in in the final year. So we have all the pieces in place to kind of support that. We're not ready, and every year that we wait. Cheaper the experience out there. Um, you know the other the other pioneers are taking the arrows while we while we wait. Uh, but but we did increase that. So that's a that's a kind of a major program we'll be talking more about a major staff effort. Starting with uh, redoing all of our route books so we can get ready to go to um, another big one we put in there was the District Administration Operations Center. Um, we really, if we had had the kind of study in place that I'm hoping to do this year with a budget of something like 25,000, I don't know if that's going to be enough or not. If we had that kind of study and evaluation in place, we might have been in a position to jump on the post office, like I said, we could have been a really great uh, facility for the district. Um, down the road, our best option may be to, um, to stay on our current site, but that will require a pretty different building than the one we have now. Parking underneath, two stories, and the rest being a equipment yard. It, it will be difficult to find a spot on the coast side that's quite as convenient as where we are for our customers and, and for us. Uh, so, but, but anyway, that's something that that we envision as well. Let's let's look at it now, and then um, it's something we we would do uh, well out in the future. Um, other significant uh, other significant projects. Uh, we put in a placeholder for uh, pipeline replacement in the final year. Uh, we've upped the budget for. Let me see where am I? Uh, we've up significantly up the budget for the Denison Treated Water Booster Station based on um, preliminary cost estimates that Kennedy Jenks did in, the, in their uh, preliminary design study. I'm on page four now. Water supply development. Uh, we kind of pushed out, uh, we, we kind of pushed out uh, these projects that Water supply projects in Denison and San Vicente uh, from the previous CIPs, maybe being a little bit more realistic about how long it's going to take us to finish the EIR process. The EIR process is going to be the easy part because this board can certify the EIR, and if we don't get sued, all we have to do is get the permits from the Coastal Commission and the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Corps of Engineers. That was simple stuff. All that stuff. So, you know, realistically, we, we may, that may take longer. Um, and um, it helps us to move those, to move those projects out to be a little bit more realistic. Oh, it was the yeah, I'm glad you asked. It's March, isn't it? Or April, isn't it? This calendar year? I'm yeah. Ask, asking fiscal year. We, we haven't done this. No, I was tempted year. to, uh, I was tempted to send you the edits that we done to the balanced hydrologics groundwater report. And we have been concerned that that 
you know, one of the biggest questions we would face would be, will our diversions in Denison and San Vicente affect the groundwater that my Terra Water and Sanitary District depends on and that um, supports the Pillar Point Marsh? And uh, Balance has done some great work on that. That's supported by all of the new gauging and groundwater, stream gauging groundwater data we've got that says, no, it, it won't have any effect. And I would like to have you know, like a two pair, two page technical memo that says that. But balance, you know, is very uh, they're scientists, they're very particular about their data and what they say, and they wrote a pretty extensive report, right. which we have which now has gone through three levels of editing, it's, it's kind of a negotiation process. We really want them, when we get them, to say, these are conclusions that we really support. So we're, we've been arguing about that kind of boundary conditions. What happens in a really dry year, and, and do we need to have some kind of restrictions on our operations? So that's the process, and, and it's involved a lot of time by our consultants, by our water rights attorney, by balance, and then that's my days. And I'm, I'm kind of a holdup. Thank you. You know, when I need to spend two days. Not for holding it up. No. <laughs> yeah. When I need to spend two days on something, it, it, it's, it takes a while to get to. You know, it's hard for me to put two days together on something. Okay, but before I forget, I, I'm going to understand that the WAVE project will get approved by the town meeting tonight or yesterday. And their plan calls to support 600 people on wells drawn. something that, that we're thinking about as we go forward because that's you know to if it's it should be something we should have as our part of our matrix that, that um, the word I was given today was that, that the county will approve that. Six hundred yeah. six hundred six it's a facility for six hundred people in an office facility that will also support a residential facility funded by the 600 person office space. And it's to go in this watershed that we talked so about now. It has to find the airport. Yep. The, the case that Balance has built is that our diversions will not affect the amount of groundwater available from that aquifer. So, so our project will not have an impact on Pillar Ridge Mobile Home community, on the wells that Monterra depends on, or on the health of Pillar Point Marsh. Just because of the, it's the nature of our diversions and the nature but of the. But if somebody function. else is drawing that aquifer down, does it impact our no. well field? No. Well, that's a different. That's a different question. Our proposed project, the one that's covered by the EIR, says nothing about groundwater. Oh, I, okay, so what we're not proposing. Our, our new project won't be impacted, but they're still, that still leaves a potential that if somebody else puts a new project in, it could damage our, our groundwater supply. There's that possibility. But the Coastal Commission has imposed a limit on total pumping from the airport aquifer, like 459 acre feet a year. And presumably any new project that comes on would be subject to that. To that limitation. Or the effect, it would still be an effective limit. Who would have to, whose supply would be diminished as, as pumping approaches the limit it would be a question. I'm not quite sure the answer to that. Okay. But certainly the Coastal Commission in approving any new wells would, would look at the groundwater supply in the same way that they did when Monterra applied for their permit for the air, airport wells. And that's where the, that was in the mid 90s and that's where the 459 acre foot limit came from. Okay. And we're just, one of the things that there's been a lot of work is, you know, I think we can stay entirely out of the discussion of groundwater. Okay. Um, out of the, entirely out of the discussion of the, of the Coastal Commission's groundwater limits, the analysis they did to come up with the limits. Balance has a lot of opinions about which they wrote about extensively. Um, they believe that that, that 459-acre-foot limit is too conservative, that it'll be higher. But you know, 
we don't want to talk about that. We're not talking about anything that will affect the groundwater. We're not proposing to increase our, our pumping of groundwater. Uh, and we've got a case that says our surface water diversion will not affect groundwater in any case. Okay. So, okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> now we're done with that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. They're making their case now. Thank you for letting me <laughs> the role. But one thing I, I have pointed out to the board uh, before is even without the EIR, even without these permits, we are doing what we've done for the last four decades in Denison, and we've got a facility that will you know, make as much water as our, some of our limitations allow, and that's a good thing. So, um, and we've talked uh, many times about the, the risks involved with these projects. Um, so um, the, other, the other thing that you'll see on our horizon on your pipeline project, and we'll talk back a little bit here, and if you've been looking at talk about lately, this is a uh, current topic, uh, is the Main Street Bridge yeah. pipeline replacement. Yeah. And we upped the budget for that. So why did the budget go up on that? Uh, we'll be talking quite a bit in the next few months about the Main Street Bridge pipeline replacement. <laughs> yeah, back and forth, two friends, back and forth. I'm yeah. bored with this whole conversation. Yeah. <laughs> So that one that would increase this by four hundred and ten thousand dollars, but uh, that may not be enough. <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, we we, well, we tended to look at that as something that that we could just do when the city did its bridge project. I think when we first put this project in the CFD, we said, oh, the city's going to build a new bridge, and that's what we did. But I thought they would do we'll just hang our new pipe on the side of the city's new bridge. Well, you know, it's going to be a while. Clearly. <laughs> Pipeline uh, water supply development on the Bridgeport uh, pipeline. I didn't understand why the numbers sort of went the way they went. Is it because the FY13 14 is what the old idea was? I, I just didn't understand why it went 110 40 and then 110 40. Is that because we're pushing it out? Yeah, we're pushing it out. Okay, but don't we need to push it in? Isn't that the well, again, Hesitation. There's, there, there are three components to this uh, water supply project that are lined up behind the permitting process mm. and the EIR. The, the, the Bridgeport Pipeline, the Booster Station, and the Dennis, and the San Jacinto Diversion Pipeline. Mm -hmm. So I've got those projects all sort of happening at the same time, but we're assuming those Part of the project description, right? Yeah. But I mean, that could be a standalone project, couldn't it? No? It doesn't, no, I don't think so. Uh, we can't really piecemeal the project. So the CEQA doesn't allow piecemealing the project. Yeah, so this is all part of um, improving our capacity from, from Denison. So, and we haven't really addressed whether we could, uh, you know, do them separately. Well, I just wondered if the pump station and the pipe wouldn't simply be a continuation of uh, the idea of having Deniston, you know, more operative and more able. And the diversion isn't really necessary for those two pieces to occur. And, and the replacement project and the pump station, it seems like they would be less uh, visible or vulnerable to controversy than the San Vicente. I, I mean, I don't know, it just seems to me like might be smart to expedite those two as a project and have San Vicente di Diversion be something separate from that. I don't know what your opinion is. And we're running up against that assuming we really get Denison going. And we were talking about putting the pump down there, right? So we're running well, up against that impediment already, right? I think the other, the other consideration that we talked about is that we face a some finite risk that we will not be able to perfect our water rights. Um, and we'll have more assurance.
assurance, we can, we'll have more assurance of that um, as we get through some of these curbing processes, I think. Um, you know, I, we're pretty, we've invested a lot in Deniston so far, and that's necessary. I guess it's, it's uh, difficult when you live uh, with an optimistic perspective and you think that you know these uh, dry and wet periods change. And if we were to get into a really significantly wet period, um, it could be possible that we could be generating quite a bit and moving into the system. So I just wonder if it's really considering that as opposed to that's a question. But, yes. but I hear the, I know the complexities, I understand, but still seems like that. system operates is uh, intriguing and, uh, and you can kind of see the financial implications of it too, right? but I, I think it's great it's the most complete uh, job that I've ever seen on CIP it looks great you guys are doing a great job I appreciate it and your homework is yeah. so uh, we can go through the CIP in, in uh, whatever detail if you'd like I like the idea of the, uh, I wish that you had more time in your schedule. Because uh, there, you know, for years, there's been sort of an undercurrent discussion about government centers, you know, uh, municipal centers uh, on the coast side. And it just seems so unfortunate that we've got all these special districts and we've got the city and we've got the county and and we've got the sheriff and all these players, and we don't really have one good central location for these activities to take place. And it seems to me it would be so much cheaper to aggregate that. You know, if, if there was a place you could go for a county building and planning, or you know, right here on the coast, and you could go to the city of Half Moon Bay for you know planning and building, and uh, you know, or water hookups or you know uh, sewer connections or whatever. But you know, we just have to go to so many different locations. And if you look at us spending $3 million or $4 million on a, an operations center, you know, if you got the city to participate in, you got the county to participate in, you got you know, a couple of special, other special districts, maybe it would be feasible to build one center you know, where, where we as citizens of the coast could, you know, could, could have our lives uh, legislated and, and regulated and controlled and permitted <laughs> all in one roof, you know. There you go. <laughs> Perfect world dreams again. <laughs> and it just seems like it might be an efficient thing to look at. So it would be really nice if there was a way to have a little outreach 
to talk to these other I, you know, I, groups and you know see what could be done I I thought about that. some point it would make sense for them to get out of that building. That building would have enough fair use on Main Street, make some lights back on Main Street, make a great bar restaurant. <laughs> uh, sewer Plant Road, over Jim, Jimmy Benjamin's dead body maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, it would make a lot of sense. I absolutely would. Yeah. Just to be able to work together and cooperate. It'd be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, we know how hard that is here. <laughs> But I think when you're looking at, you know, $3 million seven oh, years yeah, away, yeah. you know, um, a little bit of effort on, the, you know, on, on uh, somebody's opening the door and starting a conversation, I'm sure would be exciting. And I think especially for us, because uh, we've got a pretty nice piece of land on, on Main Street. I mean, it must have some value, right? So if we picked a new location in this plan, I mean, there's got to be some income generated from that property, selling that property. But I think that um, the complexities are, are difficult, and that's why I'm excited to look at the floor plan of the fire renovation, understand what the crew and, you know, those facilities, I don't want to control that, but I'd like to see what's capable of fitting in there and functioning without it being overwhelming. You know, I mean, it's overwhelming with general public right now that might be overwhelming with water district people. You know, it's not that big of a building. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see how you can configure that thing. Um, and I, I think it's uh, great to see all that falling in a reasonable budget range. And, you know, I can hardly wait to get back in our own, our own building. And you know, I miss the old building. Don't you? All right. <laughs> General Manager's report. Okay, just a couple of things. Let's see. Um, I, I, I gave you. I think I gave you in my uh, preface to the budget discussion the draft conditions update. Uh, no mandatory rationing, at least for now. Um, stay tuned. Things can change. Uh, we did get a piece of good news in March. iBank sold some bonds, refunded our loan, lowered our interest rate, and that's going to save. So that loan is now at about two and a half, that's about two and a half percent. Wow, that's a great loan to that. And, and iBank's anxious to lend us more money. They've already got our information, so we need it. So uh, I think they'll be a good source for the financing that's in our financial plan. Okay. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, okay, uh, well, the, the two significant things I already brought up at this meeting, that was the pipeline obstruction and the uh, operation of the Denison water treatment plant. Uh, we expect to get more water out of it next month. Um, actually, since I have the floor at this point, I just want to bring up that uh, with JPIA, we actually have used their training on a number of occasions. Uh, it is free about once a year. And actually, John, when John Hoff was, was our, our representative, he really bird dogged us uh, to, to, get, to take advantage, and we did. Uh, our, our, our newer representative is, has not bird dogged us as much as John has. Uh, so out of sight, out of mind type of a thing. Uh, and we did win a safety award uh, a couple of years back from JPIA for some uh, innovations that the treatment staff uh, had done. I mentioned at this uh, at this meeting. Uh, so those are the two significant things, uh, and I'll be willing to answer any questions you may have on my report. The good news is, I'm glad to see the uh, hydraulic monitor has been introduced. Yes, that's because I mean it just sat who knows where for unused for how long, and I, I know we.
have that ability? Is it, so, is it just is it too complicated or I mean, is there more experience with those type of models or they just uh, they really suck? Well, you, you're, so you're going to get an upgrade for us? I, I'd actually feel like, uh, let me, let me, let me talk to Dave and Joe about it. I have some suggestions. The price, in the, the model that used to work, and I don't mean our, our computer model, but in the past, historically, these were very cumbersome and awkward software packages, and it was way more efficient to have uh, a person who did it full time all the time do it. And the last couple times, may not be the case for this model, but I have seen some really cool examples where it's it's gone to small utilities that, that have run it themselves on very, very cost-effective software. Justin, you mean that it will apply here, but I would be delighted to pull yeah, that. Could that program. also be part of the tools that I use to find leaks? And so, the, the, so, not so much in my experience. The correlators are units that go on the, on the valves in the system and they talk to each other to tell you how, how much, much is, yeah. is leaking and where. And then you put in flow meters in the system right. and then you know how much is moving through and that goes back to the model. Right, right. So it could be a component of that. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you. Kathleen? Um, so since San Francisco has made the decision that we're going to be under voluntary for the rest of the year. They're working with Bosca on some outreach materials and they're looking at um, borrowing materials that have already been developed by other agencies um, in Northern California. So I, um, one of them is the slogan, Californians don't waste and then there's a little water drop. Um, that's something that Aqua and um, the Department of Water Resources is developed and is trying to use in their outreach. And then um, there's another one where um, that uh, Sonoma County Water Agency, and I believe the Sacramento region has been using, where it has an image and then it has, um, with different messages, uh, one of them is like the official drip irrigation of 2014. And so when you have a picture of what that, they have a little eyedropper going. And then um, underneath there's a slogan that doesn't change no matter what the message is and it just says there's a drought on, turn, turn the water off. So they're hoping to um, incorporate some of these images and messaging in, um, over the summer and fall in the Bay Area. Will we be passing out eyedroppers like we uh, finished that? No. Oh, Justin. Don't plan on it. <laughs> Do we own any, any signage like when the fire department has a burn, you know, those big graphic needles that show you the burn danger? And is there any thought of, I mean, do we have access to that sort of signage? Was my first, we don't, okay. No, we could create it, and we could create banners. Um, and some of, this, some of this artwork is supposed to be available for banners. I haven't received it yet, but um, that, that's a theory. Um, so we do have something on our website on the front page that kind of gives us, tells you where we are in our drought uh, planning and we are at the advisory level. So we could do something like that as a banner and put it up. I saw one community that had a um, two of those like fuel gauges like the city fire department uses and one was their water reservoir level and then the other one was the inverse color showing how much the community was saving, you know, how well they were doing. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really, I hadn't seen, I've seen the drought, you know, the sort of the reservoir, you know, what I call a bathtub ring mm -hmm. needle, but I hadn't seen the, how well the community's doing. Um, and then they had a mark on there of the best of previous years, you know, so it showed not only how they're doing, but they were egging them on to, hey, can you beat the last best conservation? Yeah, if you have an example of that where I could see that. The, the see big it. thing that struck me was they had it on Main Street as a like one of those fire departments, and I realized, boy, if you don't have that, you know, I don't know how you put up a big sign like, you know, do you need to own the land? Do you need to? Yeah, 
They're signing regulations. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we can't. Like, yeah. But we have we have gotten permission to put banners on our property. <laughs> that very nice. Of the wall. Yeah, yeah, on our wall. Yeah, yeah, our wall. <laughs> um, but we we you know um, we have to be careful. We have had vandalism and graffiti issues. Yeah. So um, so I'm so I, you know I'm trying to be very careful. The message is if it's gonna if it's a message that's gonna change like monthly or weekly, it's probably not best for a banner. Yeah. Because it's expensive to recreate and yeah. print them. Um, but if you know, um, but some of these other messages, you know, might be um, it's gonna last through the whole summer with these other for banners. But if you have examples, yeah, you know, no, it was fun. I've never seen the how well the community. Yeah, that is good, good feedback. Yeah. And then I, I also um, just updated the outreach tracking sheet that you, the board has seen previous meetings. Um, you know, one of the um, requests was to have expenditures. So on the far left hand side is the expenditures. And then just trying to keep it updated with what's current for our outreach. Do you have any feel on the government, uh, sorry, governor's announcement that he's considering a 20% mandatory? Yes. Um, you know, the last I heard, they were, they were trying to see if he had legal authority to do it. I, I haven't heard if he does or doesn't have the legal authority and how that would be implemented. Uh, if it did happen, it would be a huge, um, it, you know, it would be a, a dramatic change for us because then you know, regardless of what your water supply outlook is, you would then have to follow whatever the governor said. So, and um, so if he kept the 20%, then uh, and made it mandatory for all uh, all of California, then that's what we would have to look at. I was just curious. I mean, he announced that he wanted to do it, and I was very curious whether a can he do it, and b how would it be implemented? What would be the penalty? You know, I, as far as I know, it's never been done before, so we, it would be a big learning curve on yeah. how that would be implemented right. for different agencies. Yeah. And the legislature would have to pass a law on you and you could do it by executive order. He's declaring an emergency. He declared an emergency, so how much power he has yeah. over that, I... Just to say that, but yeah. he, he's hoping <laughs> that people, he's hoping that agencies do it voluntarily, but it's because you have it you have some areas in California that are very you know they're running out of water they have no water sure. so, you know trucking water and other areas like uh, the Bay Area that are a little bit better off so um, you know it's so it's very I, it's a very confusing thing for the general public to understand how you how there can be such a disparity but um, so I think that's what the governor's trying Can, can you tell um, how we as a district are doing in terms of the voluntary cut um, Is there any change at all? We have seen a decrease in sales in February and March. March was wet, so it's hard to know. Um, so we see cut back in irrigation, obviously. So, um, uh, you know, so we have seen a decline in sales, which is good. And, but. Um, it's a little too soon to, um, since we've had some rains, to, to really know, you know, how much of that is going to last through the summer. Um, uh, but we're hoping that um, that the, that our customers are responsive. They are asking questions. We are getting phone calls. So we, you know, so we think our messaging is working. And obviously, they're not just from us, but I mean, you, it's in every paper. It's every time you turn the news on, that message is getting out there. So. We're hoping that um, you know it could carry on through the summer. Mm -hmm. We really can't tell. Director Glassberg asked this question. I spent some time on it. it. It's difficult for us to tell from month to month from the data we have what's going on. So <clears throat> to, to resolve the effects of additional rainfall, yeah. um, we have bi-monthly reads. So when we say when we say this much water was used in March, it's really some some 
proportion of our customers, how much water they used in February and March. Mm -hmm. And we have, when you talk about residential, we have two residential reef cycles, one of which has 3,600 accounts on it, and the other of which has uh, 2,100 accounts. So you can imagine that sort of month to month, it's hard to get much resolution on the data when you're having to look at, at multiple months. So our overall water consumption is really, residential seems to be pretty steady. I mean, there's a steady kind of a baseline residential and there's a steady, uh, there's a pretty consistent amount of, of outdoor use by residential. And the outdoor use is going to be heavily influenced by the weather. The things that are really, very, thing that's really, really changes um, have to do with Skyline is a, is our biggest customer. Um, we were looking at some of the data from year to year. Uh, Skyline, we, our uh, irrigation um, consumption, which is class 11, which includes Skyline, went from 46 in fiscal 12 to 86 in fiscal 13. So those, I mean, that kind of thing has a big effect. Um, you know, right there, that's, that's over 5% of our total annual water consumption. It's just, you know, just, just a very limited number of customers. We don't have very many of those. We don't have very many of those accounts. So even though 60% even though of our water goes to residential, that's a pretty stable use. And, and whether we can really reduce significantly from that, Every, I think every water utility has this challenge. San Francisco was talking about it. it the last two months, um, it's all been related to rainfall. Mm -hmm. you know, it rains, people use less water, it stops raining, they turn the sprinklers back on, and it goes back up. So you're, you're trying to wonder if uh, Skyline got the Ron be gone message. I mean, it would really radically change the sales of water in the district. Yeah. I just saw that they got a new delivery of sod not too long ago. Yeah. <laughs> so they're still planning. It's just acres. Have you ever driven up there? It's just acres. And acres. It's yeah. unbelievable. That and they just keep expanding. Yes. It's, it's very expensive real estate that yeah. sells on the basis of yeah. aesthetic appeal. Yeah. And we've talked with them about, you know, is there some alternative? They're, they're our biggest customer and our big customer. They, they uh, pay the commercial rate for uh, water they don't have to pay. It's a symbiosis. Any other uh, requests for future discussions? We have a meeting on the 29th of April, and uh, that's and we're still set with the time from 3 to 5. Thank you.